that working? Good. Thanks for having me here. I should say, Myra Kraft, I have been in a canoe with Myra Kraft on the Concord River in Concord. She was a, a trustee of Brandeis University and, uh, and, uh, and alum. So anyway, uh, that's an interesting connection. I thought I'd start with a farm. I'm going to talk about food production in New England, some historical stuff, and then some stuff about the future. That's the present. It's a, a New England farm. That's actually my farm. Um, <clears throat> that's my house on the right and our woodlot in the back. It's up in western Massachusetts. Raised beef cattle, mm, butternut squash and pumpkins, pigs, timber, so forth. Kind of typical New England farm of a certain kind. And I'm throwing it up here just to make a couple points at the outset of what we need to know about me. Uh, and one is that I've been farming since the 1970s in one way or another, and I am heart and soul part of the local food movement and have been since then. Um, so I'm a true believer in, in, in that sense. <clears throat> On the other hand, I'm a, I'm a historian, and my job as an historian is to be a skeptic. And particularly to be skeptical of my own fondest beliefs. And when friends and colleagues of mine start talking about how we're going to produce all of our food locally in New England, it's pretty easy to get skeptical about that. There's about 15 million people in New England, and there's about 2 million acres of farmland in production. 5% of the landscape. We're the most forested region in the country. <clears throat> you cannot feed 15 million people on 2 million acres, and you wouldn't want to try. So if, you, if, if we're going to produce more food locally, we need to identify the social and environmental values that's, that's going to serve, and ask some hard questions about what it's going to take to grow that, and what kinds of foods should we grow here, and why should we do that. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about this evening. And oh, I welcome questions as I go along. Can you talk louder? Yes, and, and, and comments as well. <clears throat> talk louder. Right. Um, okay. Um, to, yeah. Currently, New England produces something like 10 or 12 percent of the food we consume. If you measure by acreage footprint, how many acres it takes to produce that food, and how many acres are in New England. That's the way we did some of these. Calculation. So I'm going to do a little quick history here. There's talk about how much food New Englanders produced in the past that they ate, and that's from the Harvard Forest dioramas at the Fisher Museum. If you ever have a chance to see those, they show change in the landscape of New England over time. That's somewhere in central Massachusetts in the late colonial period, the land being cleared and so forth. Before the Europeans got here, the English got here, we had a local food system in New England one that provided a great deal of very healthy food for the native people. Uh, as far as we can figure out, that was about 100,000 people. It was a good diet. Uh, we would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, I think, today to eat the diet that they ate. Um, but that was kind of the limit that, that that system could support. When the Europeans arrived, they multiplied rapidly. 30,000 of them showed up in the 1630s. By the end of the colonial period, five generations later, there was a million of them. Yeah, um, they doubled every 25 years. And they were pretty much feeding themselves by a system of mixed husbandry agriculture that they brought with them. And um, so, but there was about a million of them compared to 15 million today. They were bringing in some stuff from, you know, rum and so forth. <laughs> Starting to bring in a little wheat, but mostly it's, it's a fairly sustainable system. Um, let's look at this graphically. <clears throat> so there you have with the line on the bottom the population of New England as it's risen from 1600 to today. And the dark green line is all six New England states combined, and the other lines are the different states individually, and it shows you forest color essentially of slow clearing during the colonial period up to 1800, and then this catastrophic drop uh, in the early 19th century to the middle of the 19th century, where we get, in most New England states, um, well over half of the landscape cleared and farmed, and then an equally stunning recovery of forest in the late 19th century and into the first half of the 20th century. And since then, since about 1970, we've been losing forest cover again. Um, so that's a really interesting graph. 
uh, looks like population growth and other things are driving rapid clearing, then all of a sudden population growth skyrockets and the force comes back. Um, so by the middle of the 19th century, the landscape, same place, central Massachusetts, looked like that. 75% um, cleared, where I live in Weston, just out here. Well, I live in Weston, I farm in Western Massachusetts. Um, but Concord, 90% cleared in the middle of the 19th century. There were about 3 million people in New England, and they were mostly feeding themselves, but beginning to import grain uh, from the Midwest at that period. But still, so this was a landscape pushed really hard to produce. If you think about local regional agricultural production at its peak in terms of extraction from the land, well, that was it. Uh, mostly grassland, as you can see, pastoral, pastures, hay, very small amount of tillage. That's interesting. Uh, a typical New England town had 10% of its land in plowland and tillage and the rest in grass and, and some woodlands. Then, in the late 19th century, it looked like that, according to Harvard Forest. And these things, these were done in the 1930s, they've, they've stood up remarkably well. Um, can anyone explain, to, so the landscape is now on its way back to forest, as we saw in the graph. Classic New England story. Why did this happen? Historians? Westalization. Well, we have two interesting connected answers. Industrialization, then people moved west. So there was a lot of good farmland, and all the farmers went out there. And some of the people left the hill towns and went to work in the mills and New England's economy industrialized, right? And so because of that, all the land went back to forest. That's sort of the story we're, we're telling here. Now let me ask you a question. I assume a good part of this audience is really interested, like I am in producing more local food, more regional food. We think that's a pretty good thing. If, if the Erie Canal and a bunch of railroads in the 19th century were able to collapse New England agriculture, why in heck would we want to try to bring it back? There might be answers to that, but I'm interested. Sustainability. Okay, so maybe what they did was mining the soil in the Midwest. There were things that were environmentally wrong that made the production so cheap. That's one possible answer. I just wanted to pose that because that's a, that's a hurdle you have to think about. And in many ways, having the forest come back was a wonderful thing to happen. They pressed it way too hard in the middle of the 19th century. You can point George Perkins Marsh and Henry Thoreau were writing about how ruined the landscape was, essentially, when it was so heavily farmed. So I, it just poses an interesting kind of dilemma. I want to give you a different kind of an answer, <clears throat> which is that actually, this is what the landscape actually looked like in 1900. This is in Concord, Massachusetts. It's from, from those of you who know Concord, that's from Honkatasset Hill up in the northeast photographer named Gleason. Um, you've got a working dairy farm pasture here in the foreground, all neatly taken care of, an orchard on a knoll back there. You have a lot of farmland. You can see a lot of forest is back in the landscape. It wasn't a collapsed agricultural landscape. It was one that was going back into forest. About half of the land was forested by the early 20th century in New England, but it still had a vital agricultural sector in certain products, which would be dairy. dairy, right, vegetables, fruits, hay, um, poultry beginning to take off. So what you had was in the late 19th century, in the first part of the 20th century, an agricultural system in New England that was able to adapt to all the cheap grain that was flowing out of the Midwest and the meat. You couldn't really, you couldn't ship things like fruits and vegetables too effectively across the country at that time. And dairy, so farmers figured out stuff they could grow to feed the skyrocketing urban population. And the peak of agricultural production in terms of dollar value in New England was in the early 20th century, not in 1850. That's important if we're going to tell a story and try to look at our history and think about all this and think about what we want to do today. That's a very different sort of story than, oh, the Erie Canal went through and everything collapsed because there were better soils someplace else. Yes, sir? Uh, refrigeration. Uh, can you explain to somebody whose baseline knowledge is very low to what extent 
uh, the, the lengthening of the time to keep food okay before it was served? Well, so that's an interesting question about what's the role of refrigeration in all this. And of course, they're starting to bring meat in uh, from Chicago in the late 19th century in refrigerated railroad carts that were refrigerated with ice. So they figured out how to pack it out there and ship it back here. But I think the key part of your question is you use the word food. And some things are easy to ship long distances and keep forever, like grain. And some things like milk, you've got to get from the farm to the consumer really fast, or you've got a big problem. And there's fruits and vegetables. So all those are different kinds of foods. And the questions we're trying to ask is kind of disaggregate the idea of food and think about, OK, what stuff makes sense to grow more locally, depending on the price of energy, or the technologies you have. What kind of stuff makes a lot of sense to send long distances? So that you don't paint yourself into a corner of being either a globalist and just a, saying the free market will take care of this in the way we've had described on the one hand, or a local person who's saying we should grow everything locally, which is a ridiculous notion. So, so that's the historical setup. And here's a look at farmland instead of forest land from the late 19th century and the 20th century. And again, the this is from US Ag Census stuff. And what interests me and what I've just been telling you about is, OK, we get a big drop in farmland in the late 19th century. And then from about 1900 to the end of the Second World War, 1945, there's relative stability. A lot of noise in these, these um, data. I mean, they, the way they count farmland changes and how well they're counting it's you know, open to some skepticism. But basically, if you sort of look at that, you've got a period in the first half of the 20th century when about 15 to 20 percent of the landscape is in agriculture in New England. About six to eight million acres. And that's what I'm talking about. Then, once you've got oil, and you've got rapid transportation, and you have industrial production on farms, and you've got the Central Valley of California with massive irrigation, which takes really oil to do on that scale, for the concrete and the bulldozers and all the rest of that, you have a whole new situation where it now is possible to grow just about everything somewhere else and bring it here economically. And then you get New England agriculture driven down to 2 million acres or 5% of the landscape, which is where it's been since 1980-ish, where we've managed to hold it ever since. That's the picture of where we're at. So the question some of us asked ourselves a, while, a few years ago in doing the New England food vision was, OK, if we really want to grow food in New England, how much does it make sense to grow? What would it be? What would it take? And what are the trade-offs? We framed this question within a forest question. We got our forest back. New England's 85% forested, and I was part of a group at Harvard Forest of forest ecologists and policy people in 2005 and then in 2010 who did a couple of these visions of the future of the New England forest and said, this thing is great. It gives us all these values. Let's protect the forest. Let's not let it go in the next 50 years below 50 per of, in 50 percent of Massachusetts, 70 percent of New England. Permanently protect that because of the values, the social and environmental values that we get from forests. And we put this out there and we talk about that. There are those, are those values, the habitat for wildlife, protecting our water supply, utilizing it for recreation, sustainable wood products, and carbon sequestration. And I won't go on about this because we're not really talking about it. Although I should say, as a New England farmer, most New England farms are mostly woodlots. A lot of the income, I just sold 150,000 board feet of pine in the last couple of months. And it's a big part of what you do as a farmer. Yes, taking care of the, of the woodlands is a big part of farming. But in, in any case, um, it was important to protect those values of the forest that has returned. And so there's a a framework in asking the question of how much food we can grow of what you're going to do about the forest. In this thing, we, we said we should have about, we should have most of the protected forest protected from development, but still being productive, and have 10% of that protected forest in wild reserves that are unmanaged. Just so What's carbon sequestration? Well, so as trees grow, they're putting carbon back into biomass and into the soil. And it can stay there for a long time. And forests continue to grow for 
we don't know how long. The, the trees aren't growing as fast as they were 100 years ago, but they're still getting bigger. So forests are very effective in taking back carbon dioxide and sequestering it. If you clear it, you're going to push carbon back into the atmosphere. So that's a, that's a, a value of having forests on the landscape. I got to get back to <clears throat> food and farming. Another group of scholars that I was part of did a vision for the future of agriculture and food in New England called the New England Food Vision. You can find it online. We put it out as a similar kind of a booklet. And it's interesting, the values that we identified there are on the, the cover and then the same ones that are the heart of this course, right? Sustainability, health, and, and justice. So there, there are those values. If you're going to grow more food, you have to be trying to, when you're part of this movement and you endorse these values, you have to think about how is that going to, to effectively serve these things all put together. I put that sign in there, which is from a group called Cultivating Community. That's an urban farm in Portland, Maine, just because all of those values are on the sign. The Boyd Street Urban Farm, helps to make the healthiest food accessible to all and models how sustainable food production can happen in cities. So this is a movement that's from urban areas to rural areas and you know, in a lot of complicated ways and we wanted to put together something that spoke to all of those, all of those values. <clears throat> just faith, we've been starting to talk about this, yes, food is cheap, but as our other speakers have been alluding to, there's still 15% or so of Americans and of New Englanders who are not getting as much food of the kind of food they would like as when they want. So, and those figures have been reasonably steady for, for a while. So, so there's an issue of food justice in, in this. Is everyone getting enough and that's what they want? And the answer is no, even though it's so cheap, and that's interesting. Obviously, the problem is poverty. So cheap food has not solved the problem of poverty. It's just stating the obvious. This I can't unpack to you, but what we did was we we modeled different kinds of diets and said, if we're going to project how much food we can grow here, for what way of eating? And all we did was take the USDA's recommended diet, pretty much, which could be satisfied in all kinds of different ways, depending on how you want to eat, and did it as a kind of average across the population. And so you see the different ways here that, that we eat. Essentially, the current one is there. And if you look at these others that we modeled, one we called the Omnivore's Delight, uh, there's a lot more vegetable and fruits being consumed. Uh, there's more whole grain. There's less meat as part of the protein, and, and so forth. So there's an issue of the way we are eating that is connected to the way we produce food and the way it's processed and distributed. And you want to be able to try to address that problem. And then the one we were just talking about, the other constraining factors, you want to have the production be sustainable, which means protecting the forest, protecting water supplies, things of that sort. Long story short, we ran calculations with the diet and the, and the um, population, and basically, New England could grow something like 50% of its food if we were willing to triple our farmland base. If we would go from 5% to 15% of the landscape in agriculture over the next 50 years or century or whatever it might be, and leave 70% of the landscape in forest, as we said in the forest vision, we could, we could produce about 50% of our food. And those are the things that, it seemed to us as we wrote this and studied it, made the most sense to produce in New England. And son of a gun, they're the things that we were producing 100 years ago. So if we're looking to some version of a post-oil future, whatever that may be, because of constraints on carbon, for example, that raise effectively the price of energy, these are the sorts of things that might make sense in the future. Essentially, let me just run through them quickly. Vegetables. A lot of the local food movement and production today is about vegetables, and there's a reason for that. Those are things that give you a lot of benefits from producing locally, and they don't take a lot of acreage. Half a million acres would do it. There's about 100,000 acres in, in vegetable production in New England today, uh, we could take that up some distance. We could put a lot of this in cities and suburbs 
and in small scale is the, kind of the way it's being done. And so just from a point of view of acreage and the ability to do it, we can do that. Now there's seasonality issues and a lot of other things that we could talk about, but that is something that's doable and that gives you a lot of social and environmental benefits. Similarly with fruit, but it's tougher to find enough land to do that. Yes, two right. questions actually. Well, why, don't we, why don't we let them wrap up and then two questions. You want me to do that? Yeah, why don't you let them wrap up. Yeah. All right, let me run through them, then we can go back to some of these things. Yeah. So fruits, we could do, we could do, about half of the fruit that we consume in America is grown in temperate climates, and about half is subtropical, bananas and, and oranges and orange juice and so forth. So we basically said, okay, keep the subtropical part coming, bring the temperate production back to New England. We have good land for fruit. The big kicker in here in terms of acreage is dairy. New England produces about half of its dairy products today in New England. If we were to produce all of our dairy products and do it on grass, instead of with enormous grains uh, subsidies, that's what drives dairy uh, milk production so high, we could do that. And we have the soils and climates to do that, and it's better for the cows, and it's better for us in terms of the quality of the fat that's in there and that the grass cover is better for the environment than the way we're producing dairy and beef as a kind of extension of that today. So if we look at what it makes sense from our analysis to do in New England, that sort of takes care of it. The, the dairy, the vegetables, the fruits, some beef. We put a big reduction in beef consumption in here, but we increase the production that's being done in New England. We can do this other stuff, the pork, the poultry, the eggs, locally and regionally, but we have to buy the grain to do it. We cannot grow the grain to do that in New England. The acreage is not there. And even if you pasture your pigs and pasture your poultry, they're still eating grain. They're eating probably as much grain as if you didn't, in some cases more. They're eating lots of other stuff that makes them tastier for us and they have happier, healthier lives, but the grain is still crucial and the acreage is not there to do that in New England. But grain is a, something that makes sense to bring long distances. That's why we got Iowa and Kansas. <laughs> I lived in Kansas. There's issues then okay, about the way it's being produced, but they're separate from the question of, oh, we should grow it all. We can grow some grain more in New England, but we can't find millions of acres for what we consume, let alone what goes through our livestock. And that's what reduced meat consumption. And then there's all these issues concerning fisheries that I don't want to get into because they're even more complex than farming stuff. So half our food we can bring in, half our food we, half our food we can produce here, half we still need to bring in, roughly speaking. And this is really pushing the boat out. I mean, this is clearing 4 million acres and going from 5% to 15% you know, in, in, in agriculture. So this is, a, this is an incredible change. If we were to accomplish this, this would be a tremendous thing. And there's lots of challenges that would have to be overcome. But the other side of the story is there's lots of things that it makes sense to bring in from someplace else. It makes sense, I think, to be both local vores and somewhat cosmopolitan and global in the way we get food. Back in the old days, as we've been talking about centuries ago, when all agriculture was local, what it meant was every few years there was a famine. And people died. So isn't there a way to get the best of both worlds out of this? I think maybe there is. I don't, certainly don't think it would be easy to get there. I'll just leave that slide up there. It's just to say that different parts of the landscape would have different amounts of forest cover and different kinds of production in them. If we were to do this, it would produce, it would, it, would, it would present us with some enormous challenges. And just let me repeat two of them. One of them we've been hearing from about already, one of them I brought up. One is that we got to balance the food production with the value of the forest, or the value of the environment. Food production inevitably puts a lot of pressure on the environment. We can do it better than we're doing it today, but we got, the, the forest is really valuable, so that's, this really puts that issue in front of you. Would you rather keep growing it in the Midwest and incurring the environmental costs of, of that, talking about the way we grow grain today, or do more of it at home and own some of the environmental responsibilities? Second question, which has been coming up, is 
if we grow food that's sustainable and healthy and has all these great social values, it's going to cost more. It's going to cost, I don't know how much more, but quite a bit more. So how do we satisfy this food justice and accessibility parts of the vision and the other side of a decent return to producers and sustainable production and all the rest? So, leave it there to bring us. Great.